Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of PDA Dad UK. Uh, before we go on any further, I want you to just hop on, hit like, hit subscribe and ring the bell so that you know we've got new content coming up because we've got a stack of good stuff coming up, including some interviews with today being no exception. So you remember a, uh, a week or so ago, I did a video on the polyvagal system, which is something I came across through the PDA Summit. And it fascinated me and it explains so much about the, the issues I face with my daughter and uh, we'll chuck a link in the description. You can go and have a look at that. As a result of that conversation, uh, a, a lady reached out to me and who works in this field, actually works studying and working through the polyvagal system and using it to, to help others. So uh, I'll introduce her now. This is Sean Hill. Welcome, Sean. Hello and thank you. And thank you for inviting me to have this conversation, Dylan. Um, no, Duncan, exactly. <laughs> we were just the irony of that is that we were just having this conversation before we went online we? Am I getting names wrong I was just beautiful yeah. <laughs> so thank you for um it's an honor to be here having this conversation such important conversation because as you know polyvagal theory has completely transformed the way we understand everything about how humans behave how humans interact how humans experience things and also about trauma as well which as you know is one of one of what one of the things that I do so um for anyone that doesn't know me um like you beautifully said I'm Sean Hill um and I um am a therapeutic coach an educator and relational trauma specialist and I teach parents, caregivers, and people working with children how to tune into the power of their nervous system so that they can support, nurture, and heal themselves and any child with confidence and ease, and also break generational cycles of trauma as well. So um, it's an honour and a privilege to be here chatting to you about this today. I'm so stoked to have you here because I th I th it is just so fascinating. Uh, my first question would be, just to jump straight in, is how did you get into this field? What, I, I tend to find with people, there's usually a story, when you get into this kind of work, there's a story that goes behind it. What, Always. What story? I, every, well, we've all got a story, but with things like this, absolutely. There's also always a reason. It's actually quite a long story, mine is, and I'll condense it into a very, very <laughs> short version. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. The, the short version of my story is that I had a very traumatic upbringing all throughout my childhood, had three abusive relationships, the last of which nearly killed me, moved 200 miles away from family and friends to somewhere I'd never lived or been before in order to escape that and for me and my children to be safe enough. I've got three kids. All three of my children had experienced complex trauma. One of my, my eldest son is also autistic. And as you can imagine, it's a bit of a challenging time. There was a lot of stuff my younger son was going through in particular. And fast forward a few years later, through a lack of awareness and understanding of school, which I know is going to resonate with you and so many of your viewers as well. Like I deal with school trauma a lot with the parents yeah. I work with. There was an incident in school that should never have happened re-triggered a lot of past trauma for my younger son. Later that night, he had a breakdown and tried to kill himself. He was 11. And as you and many of your readers are going to know and understand all too well, sadly, there was just no support. There was no help. Like I can remember ringing cams, sobbing my heart out on the floor of my kitchen, um, desperate to get him some help and support, only to be told that it would be a minimum of a two year wait unless things got worse. And I could, I can still remember now, sat on that floor thinking, kind of being dumbstruck over the, number one, how can you tell me that my son has to wait two years when he's just tried to kill himself? But more importantly, how can you say, unless it gets worse? I was like, and I said- How much them, worse can it get, yeah. really? And I actually, I actually said to the, the psychologist on the phone, so are you telling me that unless my son does a better job of killing himself, he's not going to get any support? And the silence at the other end of the phone was deafening. I think it was partly because of everything that we'd been through, but also because as parents, our children are more important to us than anything else in the world. We want to support them. We want to be able to protect them. We want to be able to help them in the best possible way we can. And 
because of everything we've been through, and there had been many times I'd let him and my other kids down through no fault of my own when I was doing the best that I could, but I was I was needing to survive in the best way that I could at the time. There was lots of times I'd let them down and I'd failed them. And in that moment, kind of sat on the floor sobbing, I was like, somehow I'm going to become the help and support he needs. And there was this determination and fire in my belly that it wasn't okay that no, no one was going to help him. And I wasn't going to spend my energy trying to fight that. I was going to spend my time and energy becoming the help and support he needed. I'd, I was already working with um, parents who'd experienced abuse anyway. So I already had kind of what I now call a surface level understanding of trauma. And it led to me learning more about how the body works, about trauma, about attachment, about early trauma. And that led to me discovering polyvagal theory. And a polyvagal theory absolutely, like I said earlier, it's changed the way we look at everything. Understanding polyvagal theory in amongst everything else that I was learning and practicing absolutely changed everything for me and my children, all of my children. Like my children now are 18, 19 and 22. So they're not what they call children anymore. But it's completely changed our relationship. It's changed their lives. It's changed their future as well. As you can tell, like I'm, I'm really passionate about this subject, but I'm even more passionate about getting education resources and support out to parents because mm -hmm. parents, number one, parents need and deserve this stuff to know this stuff because their children need them to. And not knowing this stuff disempowers parents. It disempowers children through no fault of their own. Like they're doing an incredible job. This Some parents are doing an incredible job in incredibly challenging situations, situations that people who haven't been through stuff like that can't even imagine possible. Since then, I've had the honour now of working with over a thousand parents and I've had the honour of seeing how much things have changed for them and their children. I've worked with many parents who children do have a PDA profile. I also work with parents who have a PDA profile themselves. I, I've so, interviewed a couple of adults now who, who are in the same situation. They recognise that they themselves got PDA, but I, mean, I see it always under the autism umbrella yeah. anyway. And actually, I know that PDA is also its own thing, but, Absolutely. Uh, you know, realistically, it all relate. And, and when you get to the, I hate the word, but the comorbid conditions, the co-diagnosed conditions that come along, so like ADHD, SPD, the, All those things. Any label, it gives us an opportunity to understand and it opens up a surface level of understanding about what some, th what's going on for one person, about what they might be experiencing. But it is only a surface level thing. And also it can open, it can open a doorway to more support. And you will know exactly why I've said the word can, um, as will so <laughs> your listeners. Because like, I, I can remember with my autistic son, like there was this belief and expectation that, oh, well, once he's diagnosed, he'll get this support and that support, and this will happen in school. And none of that happened for yeah. us. And that's so true for so many other parents. Quite often... What happens is that we hold on to a label or other people do and associate things that that person or that child can or can't do as a result of that label. And then what's happening is we're dismissing and dishonouring and disrespecting that person's experience and are not able to meet them where they are, which is how change can and does happen, especially within the autistic community and for autistic people. Like I've been there with my son there has been historically so much albiism and so much pressure over and I want, I want to control and change that person or that child to kind of bash the autism out of them. Or The, the last video I posted was actually uh, about me and my guitar, essentially. But it's I that. So I'm, but I'm using, I was using it because there's this perception that autism and neurodiversity in general are an issue that needs to be fixed and it's just really isn't that way it's a different way of viewing the world and perceiving the world and processing it around us and i was using the example of my electric guitar and my acoustic guitar and i could play two the same piece of music through the two guitars 
and it has an entirely different translation. And some pieces of music will work for one guitar and not the other, and vice versa. Some music will work for both, but it's it's they're, they're the same instrument with a very different application. And I, to me, that's what neurodiversity is. It's it's just a different way of interpreting the information. The same notes go in. What comes out of the other side is very different. That's not broken. That's not a problem. It doesn't need to be fixed. It needs to be appreciated. For exactly. Exactly. That's what I, I'm. You know, the labelling thing comes back to that. In um, some ways, labels are important. They you know, are. Because if I want to help my daughter in the best way I can personally, understanding that she's an autistic, understanding that she has a demand avoidant profile is integral and imperative to be able to make that, I mean, help me to support her and understand where she's coming from. It's when it becomes, it's the Rain Man syndrome, isn't it? You just Everything gets tarred with the same brush when yeah. it's a completely... <laughs> isolated interpretation of the uh, element of something it yeah. does and like and like you said and, and like i wholeheartedly agree with you it's like it's it's really important for so many people that diagnosis and that label but we need to we need to recognize that it's just a surface level it helps give us a basis of understanding and it's also i feel this conversation is also important for people who don't yet have a diagnosis or are moving towards getting one or who have children who are on that pathway because so often there's this misconstrued and understandable belief that we can't do anything to support our child or ourselves or this person until they have that diagnosis and again it's the no but if we understand that the diagnosis and the label is just a surface level thing then actually that doesn't stop us or prevent us from supporting that person or helping them understand themselves even before they have that diagnosis. So to go to sidestep back to something that you just beautifully said about neurodiversity, one of my things is about us leading with compassion, about us understanding what's going on for someone, or even if we don't understand, understanding that there's something going on for them yeah. and meeting them where they are. And for me, that's what compassion is, is all about. Human beings are a neurodiverse species. Yes. If we dissect and, uh, and um, chunk down on new, new, the word neurodiverse, neuro represents nervous system. Diverse, different. We all have a nervous system. That's what unites us as a species. Our nervous system drives, shapes and influences everything that we experience, everything that we think, feel, do and what we don't do. And we've all got one. It just works in different and unique ways, depending on us as an individual, our past experiences, our needs. And that's what makes us all different. The world would be a bloody boring and, and eventful <laughs> place if we all worked in exactly the same way. Although the nervous system works in exactly the same way for all of us, whoever we are, there are nuances in how our nervous system works, depending on us as an individual. Everybody is different. We are all different. We all have different individual unique needs, experiences and differences. And actually what we need to be doing is moving towards a culture of understanding that of acknowledging that and embracing everybody's differences rather than trying to make everybody fit in or conform or be something other than who they are. Because apart from the fact it's absolutely not okay to do that, it causes them a whole host of problems through their life when it does. And it costs our society as a whole a huge price. But the cost of that individual you can't put a price on. And That's what really, different. really fascinating me about this, and, and with, especially with the polyvagal system, because it taps into this uh, something that is very true from my experience. You could be a neurotypical person, and it only takes one traumatic event in your life, and it can switch that, and you can become yeah. neurodiverse because this the trauma influences our perception of the world around us. So if we've no. You know, you talked about you, you've been in an abusive relationship. It was very dangerous. So your polyvagal system would have picked up on that. And suddenly it starts interpreting the danger signals of other people around uh, you in a different way. This is a really interesting conversation now to go down a road of. The reason it picks up on those cues 
is because trauma is held in the nervous system. Yeah. Like a lot of people get trauma wrong, partly because no one's actually told them what trauma really is, but also yeah. because we can carry so much conditioning and beliefs around what we think trauma is and what that means about us and what that means about other people and our children and so on. So trauma is essentially something that just happens too much, too soon, too fast for our nervous system to handle. And it's what it then holds on to. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of people think that trauma is in the event. It's what happened. It's not. It's in how our nervous system needed to respond to what happened and then what it needed to hold on to as a result. Because traumatic, a traumatic experience is how our nervous system needed to respond to something, what we were experiencing as a result of that. Trauma is where our nervous system holds on to that. Something happens in our lives, a survival response gets activated, it becomes too overwhelming for us, in other words, becomes too much, and then what happens is we collapse into that survival response that survival response gets trapped in our nervous system. We can't complete it or resolve it. And what also happens then is the sensory experiences, the emotions, feelings, and sensations we were experiencing at the time get trapped in our body, as does the memory of what happened. And um, that can also be a cognitive thing as well, but it's the nervous system and the body that's key. And then what happens is because that survival response was trapped, is trapped within us, and it wasn't able to complete, it's no different to having like a cut on your arm, right? It's like that, and actually trauma comes from the word wound. So what happens is, you know, like if you've got a big cut, you bang it, you walk into a door frame or you accidentally bang it or something, it opens it back up, it bloody hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. It yes, starts it bleeding. <laughs> That's what trauma is. So what happens is um, you've got this trapped survival response inside you, and when something in the environment around you or inside you reminds your body of that trapped response, it reactivates it. A lot of people, this they'll look at it as it's triggered something within me. I was right? about to say, that's, I mean, here we come into the word trigger, which I think it, yes. it's so often associated when we talk about autism, when we talk about neurodiversity, hmm. especially with things like meltdowns and when you, receive, when you, you, you enter into the sort of challenging behaviours element of uh those those things that, that those forms of neurodiversity you get the triggers so what what are the triggers and it's and what what you're saying explains that so much because it's to boil it down to an oft used phrase it's once bitten twice shy yeah and this thing so what happens is because it's held in your nervous system your nervous system knows and it recognizes those cues then as being dangerous or threatening and reactivates them and also that that changes the way you navigate the world as a result, because what happens is, and I use the analogy of a tiger chasing you, right? Because I just think it's a really great visual representation for people to understand. But say like a, a tiger suddenly jumps out from somewhere, you start running because bloody scary, you don't want to get eaten by a tiger, <laughs> right? It activates your stress response system. It, it push, Your body goes into a flight response. Now, the important thing here, and this is important for everybody, but especially within autism and PDA, is that we don't get to choose. Our nervous system chooses for us. To it's feel reflexive. Yes, reflexive, depending on the level of threat it determines and also the situation that's happening. So... What, so say in this situation, I'm able to run and my nervous system is like, it gives me the energy and resources because that's what survival responses are doing. They're mm. recognizing there's a, there's a danger or threat and it's given us the resources and the energy to be able to protect ourselves and ensure our survival in the best possible way. So that could be fight, flight, it could be fight. Like, I'm, I'm sat here in my dining room. If a tiger, and yeah, it's not going to happen in Western Supermare, but you never know, right? <laughs> <laughs> never, There's never a whole book on it, isn't there? A tiger never, it could happen. Yeah. yeah, say a tiger suddenly jumped in here, right? And it came through the door. I've only got one door here. And although I've got a window, it's one of those that's got a top opener. And it's very, I wouldn't be able to climb out of it, right? So if a tiger is suddenly running here, number one, the first thing we do is look to others. We communicate with others to look to them for, to support us. 
can't do that. I can't run away because there's nowhere to run away to. So my, the, my nervous system activates my body more into a fight response. Can't fight. Like if I try and fight this tiger, I'm going to die. So what am I going to do now? Well, my next, my next option is I'm going to freeze. That could be, I can't get my words out. I can't move. Or at the other end of the spectrum, because freeze is a whole spectrum of responses. At the other end of that response, it could be physically collapsing. And like my body shutting completely shutting down and well which is an autistic thing in itself they're, they're, yeah you know I, i've interviewed amanda hall who took, spoke about this which was to do with shutdowns and the internal meltdown she calls it but it's that thing where the body literally just shuts down completely behavior especially in the context of children is an expression of a biology and with children it's what their body is communicating to us that they need from us. If we look at behavior in that way, it can help us have a lot more compassion for our children because like I've been there in the past, you go like, why is she doing this to me? Why is he doing that to me? And it's not, it's about what they're experiencing inside them that their body doesn't yet have the capacity to be with or manage. And they're communicating that to us in the only way they can in the moment to say, hey, I need some help here. I came across this, so I was at a talk and the chap was speaking and he was actually talking about behaviours that challenge. And, yeah. uh, and what he was actually saying is that any behaviours that challenge are the result of a need that's unmet. Yeah. So when you're experiencing a challenging behaviour and you're experiencing a meltdown or aggression or if it, you know, language or, or a shutdown or anything like that, anything that's, you know, uh, pre presenting a, 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 a problem at that, that moment look for the unmet need and if you're looking for the unmet need are they hungry it could be just as simple as they, they're hungry they don't know how to express it properly if they've got sensory processing disorder it may be jumbled up and it's not processing in the right way their body's crying out for food but they're unable to process it as this is my hunger talking and so it's a need that's unmet so and by identifying what we talked about before with the triggers and by understanding the triggers and where they come into this whole, the, the nervous system and what you're talking about with it being a, a nervous response as much as a cognitive response. It's it, um, you, what you're doing is looking for when they're acting a certain way, there's usually a pattern to it. And so you can start to learn what the need that they're expressing here. Is it that it's too loud in the room and there's too many lights? Is there too much going on? <laughs> Are they hungry, thirsty? Are they just tired? You know, so many yeah. different things. It can just be that simple as well. Like, don't get me wrong. There are many times when it is more complex, but it can just be that simple. And like what you just said is beautiful. Like human beings are patterning creatures. When you start noticing and observing what's going on for your child or for other people or for yourself, you start noticing the patterns because there's this like, there's this beautiful saying that how, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And it's so true because although on the surface it might look different, underneath it's the same. A trigger is something either in the present moment that is sending us a cue of danger or threat, or it's something in the moment that is awakening and reactivating a past experience that's held within us. Um, PTSD is a beautiful example of that, I would think. It is, it is. Go back to the tiger thing for a moment. Like I've got these res responses. If I, um, say I wasn't able to move th through that afterwards, I wasn't able to resolve that survival response. So say that tiger decided I wasn't a good lunch for him today and he buggered <laughs> off. Right? Even though I'm able to, um, to then be able to move and express that, that doesn't necessarily mean I'll come back of that survival response. Because what happened may have been too much for my nervous system to process. So we go into a survival response. And then when we come back down and out of it, we just we have to be able to move through that, but also discharge that sympathetic energy as well. Some people think that is the fight and the flight. And it's not. It's separate to that. It's part of how we then integrate that response, um, that survival stress response in our body. Say you're hungry right like uh, uh, when you're hungry and you're you're you get to the point where you haven't eaten for long enough and it that becomes a threat to your body yes. right so what happens is you're not just there isn't just a need for hunger 
there's also then a stress response that gets activated because your body is in danger. Because where we, our nervous system, when it detects cues, it detects cues from the environment around us, the environment inside us, the people around us, just from what we sense and feel electromagnetically from their bodies and from their nervous systems, and then what we also sense from our interactions with them as well, from their body language, from their gestures, from their facial expressions, and from their tone of voice. You think of a child, they might be like, come in, a small child may come at you and be pulling at your jumper, like, mum or dad or whatever, thing. and you're like, oh, what, what are you going on? It could just be that they're hungry, and actually they, they're using that first survival strategy because they're coming to get support. They're using their social engagement system yep. in order to defend that threat. So what happens is you haven't now just got a need for hunger. You've also now got a need for safety. So what happens is that, number one, we need to rec- be able to tune into and recognise that, oh, no, that's the cue for that's That's because there's an unmet need for safe, um, for food, for hunger. But that won't necessarily meet the need for safety. There are three different parts of the nervous system. There's a social engagement system, the sympathetic system, and the shutdown system, which is the dorsal vagal part of our nervous system. Under threat, it's the freeze shutdown response. At ease, it's an essential part of how we live our lives and how we function, because it governs how we rest, how we recover from injuries. It covers digestion. And it also, it's important for conservation and hibernation as well. It's how animals hibernate, but not under threat. This is at ease. It's when they feel, we feel safe enough to be in that part of our nervous system. Now, what makes this more interesting when, so with food, you could have a child or an adult who is hungry in the moment and that hunger in the moment will reactivate a past traumatic experience which again like we said it can be anything like we often look at trauma as big stuff and actually it can be misattunement it can be not feeling seen heard and understood it's just it's something that was overwhelming something that was frightening something that was distressing and because our children come into our world completely dependent on adults then not being seen and heard, not feeling supported, not knowing you can depend on this person around you, that's a threat to our survival. It's a threat to to our existence. Um, So something that can seem tiny can actually, well, as we know, from a sensory processing perspective, something that can feel tiny to one person can be feel huge to another. Magnified. Um, Inevitably for somebody else. For years, I had to cut all the labels out of my clothes. I don't have sensory processing disorder, but I had a lot of sensory needs because of early trauma. And what's actually interesting and is even more interesting with my autistic son, actually, how his sensory needs and processing has changed. As I have built more safety and capacity and regulation within my own system, that need has changed. So most of the time, I can wear labels on my clothes now. If a label starts irritating me, it's normally a surefire sign that I've got too much stress going on in my life. In social engagement, we feel safe, we feel connected, we feel engaged, and we're at ease within our bodies and with the, within the environment around us and with the people around us. When we're in our sympathetic nervous system under threat, then what happens is that we can tolerate less. Our body isn't concerned about safety or connection. It's only concerned about getting away from or defending against danger. The world becomes a more demanding place. And we notice more threatened cues and threatened danger cues in the environment because we're trying to get away from that metaphorical tiger. If I wasn't able to complete that response, if that tiger jumped into my living room, then what would happen months, years, even decades later is that something happening as simple as somebody closing a door or opening a door could feel like that tiger was about to eat me again it Take makes so much sense yeah. you, know, you, you, you see it in so many <laughs> things and i mean I, i'm going to use my, my son as an example in this because I mean, he's neurotypical when my daughter is winding up if, you, if we can see we're heading for uh, a meltdown episode or an aggression episode his responses are immediately kind of i'm going to go and sit down he'll get out of the way 
or he goes to the fight thing. He's like, you're not going to interfere with me. And he, we, we have to get in and make sure things don't escalate. But you've got those two responses and it's before anything's happened. You get, you can see it in him. He's recognizing those, those, yeah. like you say, triggers. They're the, they're the subtle things. And it is, it's a look on her face. It's a tone in her voice and you yeah. know it's coming. And I've learned to interpret that myself, but he does it instinctively. When you have a nervous system that doesn't feel safe enough, either because it's a small child and they don't yet have the capacity to be able to feel safe enough themselves, they need, they need the capacity of other adults around them who feel safe enough in that moment in order to feel safe within their own body. Or if you're autistic, and you don't yet have that foundation of safety and full regulation within your nervous system and body, because with autism, it takes longer to develop within the context of a safe, attuned and trusting um, relationship and a safe enough environment. The nuances with autism and the differences with autism mean that is that there's a difference in how the social engagement system works. So what happens is, an autistic individual finds it more difficult to read safety cues. And as a result, they interpret more cues as dangerous or threatening as a result. And it will either take them longer to process something or they'll process something more quickly. And as you'll know, sometimes it can be a combination of that as well. Absolutely. It's not we've talked about this with, my, you know, my daughter in some ways is very attuned to danger. And yeah. it is the threat of people and that kind of stuff. And she's very wary, but she can quite happily walk to the edge of a cliff and have a peer over and get no sense. Now, that's, this, is, this is a really important point. So I'm really glad you brought that up because while we're in a sympathetic place, we're actively looking for threats and danger. Whereas once you drop into that shutdown place under threat, which is where the, the, the freeze response lives, then what happens is everything is too much. It's overwhelming. You can't do things. So a lot of people will think, oh, someone's not doing something because they don't want to. It's because they physiologically cannot. So that's where, in the context of PDA, the demands become too much because life is too demanding. The whole point of it is disconnection. It's to disconnect you from your experiences and from yourself so you can shut things, you, your body can shut things down. In that place, especially if you've been living there for a while, you don't notice as many cues around you. There can be lots of cues that we find as threatening or dangerous and that activate our system more. We can be, in some ways, averse to risk, in some ways, be magnetic towards risk. Then also, it means that it can numb us out to stuff. We can think things aren't dangerous when they are. Traditionally, it's looked at as, oh, it's because it's too demanding. And it is because it's too demanding. But let's dive below that. Why is it too demanding? Because they're in a shutdown place where it's become too much. So what do we need to do to bring some sense of safety into this environment and into our relationship with that child? Is it us, perhaps? In a compassionate way, is it our nervous system that's activated at the moment and the cues that their nervous system is picking up from ours that's making it too much for them in the moment so that we can come into connection with them very gently and come into relationship with them so that they feel safe enough to re-emerge from that shutdown place and bring in some sympathetic energy. And also, we need to understand here that if someone has been in a chronic shutdown place for a long time or been trapped in a freeze response for a long time, then coming out of that can feel dangerous and very terrifying. So feeling anything can have a, have a huge response and a huge trigger associated with it because it's too much. That in itself becomes too much for us. What happens then is we get stuck in a survival spin cycle, right? So our body or the environment perhaps people around us are trying to get us to come out to survival mode but it's not safe enough and we don't have the resources and capacity to do so so what happens is we go spinning and looping back and forth between sympathetic and shutdown and it's only in social engagement where we feel safe it's only in social engagement where we're in to integrate this stuff where we're able to discharge our survival energy for me it's um 
it, it's like a, a washing machine, right? You're in, you're in like this big industrial sized washing machine and it's going round and round and round. It's bloody terrifying. You can't see properly. Everything looks all fuzzy because the washing machine is going round. And then what happens is someone opens the door of the washing machine. But because you've been going around in that washing machine, you're a bit disorientated. You're a bit all over the place and you can't stand properly, you can't think properly, whatever. So you go slowly try and climb out this wash machine. It's almost a bit like there's a metaphorical wet sock on the floor. You put your foot on the floor, you slide on this wet sock and you end up falling backwards into this huge industrial sized washing machine. And because it's a magical washing machine, <laughs> the door, the door shuts behind you and the washing machine starts going again. And we can so often find ourselves and our children can find themselves as well, stuck in these cycles. It's almost like the eye of the storm is, is the analogy mm. I'd use, because you get the initial meltdown, that sort of situation, and it calms, but it picks up again very quickly. And you, you've got to be very careful yeah. in the eye of the storm. There's a way to sort of get out of it sometimes, but usually you're just heading for the other side of the storm to hit. And I think it's that thing, you fall back into it because I always liken it to a glass. So I think it, it, I think this works with this. We've got an internal glass, which is our emotional capacity, if you like. Now, that's any emotion, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, joy, entertainment, you know, whatever the, the emotional input, we've got this glass that is able to contain it. And for, for myself, you know, it empties and, it, you know, it, it fills up again during the day if I'm in a stressful situation or if I'm more aware, I, I do crossing duty at my son's school. And so obviously my glass is a bit fuller then because I'm aware that I've got to be aware of everybody else's safety as well with it. So you, you, you said, oh, for people like my daughter, that glass is nearly always full. And so it doesn't take much for it. Let's get that final layer and it all spills over. But of course, if we've had, a, if we've had an, an episode, if we've had some challenging behaviours, we've had a meltdown, that glass is still just teetering and you might come off the meltdown, but yeah. it's only going to take a drip and it's all going to go back over again. So it's like that we say, it's only going to take that, that wet sock that you just, that, if that's what you put contact, you're going to fall yeah, back. Over. Absolutely. As we've been talking about, um, unresolved survival responses get trapped in our nervous system, right? And it holds them. And that's because our nervous system is like a container and it only has a certain amount of capacity. Uh, what happens is that when we're born, we have no capacity because the social engagement part of our nervous system isn't working. Okay, we have no access to it. The only way we have access to it is in the presence of a safe adult when our needs are met and when we're feeling at ease with them and in the environment. Then what happens is over time, over a period of, well, first of all, the first three years, and then continually throughout our childhood towards adulthood. And we're not fully developed until mid-late 20s. Some would argue for men, it goes well beyond that. Yeah, I still feel like I'm 12. <laughs> <laughs> As our ability to, number one, feel safe, but number two, be with stress increases, <laughs> the size of our container grows. If we're holding on to a lot, our nervous system is holding on to a lot of trapped survival responses, whether that's because... It was stress that we or that we couldn't integrate, or whether it was something traumatic that builds up and builds up and builds up over time inside our nervous system. So, to use your analogy, it can be used like it can be like a glass where it's completely full, and you put one tiny drop on, and it all spills outside. It spills outside because it's got nowhere to go. If someone is autistic and they don't yet have that foundation for safety, a similar thing happens. You know that wound you've got on your arm that we were talking about earlier? If it's a big wound, you'll have scar tissue around it. Like, what does scar tissue do? It protects that wound. So the scar tissue is rigid. It's inflexible. It doesn't move very much. There's this inflexibility and rigidity um, because they, don't yet, they haven't yet built the capacity to feel safe enough with that thing or that thing hasn't yet been healed and resolved this rigidity happens because this stuff gets trapped in this container and over time there's less room for stuff to move there's less flow there's less space to breathe there's only so much it can take and this is what happened with my son 
when he had a breakdown, so much had been packed into his nervous system and was stored in his nervous system. And then this incident happened in school. His nervous system container was like a dorm- dormant volcano. That one thing for him, it just so happened it was something big. For many of the parents that I've worked with, it was actually something tiny. It was a tiny, tiny little drop for them or the children. That volcano erupts. And it either erupts outside of us. And like, you know, those moments where you're triggered or something happens and you verbally spew all your pain and send safety onto somebody else. Or what it does is it internally combusts. So for him, it was a breakdown, it was depression. And this is actually where depression comes from. In most cases, it's suppressed anger and suppressed sympathetic energy that hasn't been able to be processed and the body's holding on to. And over time, it takes a huge amount of toll on the body. because We've got these survival responses and we go down to freeze. Now, if we're in the context of a social environment, we've also got another response available to us. And that's the fawn response. And the fawn response is essentially, I'm in a free place of, uh, either I'm in a place of freeze or this thing is so threatening that I need to go into this place of disconnection. And it's a very adaptive, it's an adaptive response because what it does, a fawn response is it goes, right, well, I'm going to bring in that social engagement system. I'm going to utilize that system to try and find a sense of safety, to try and find a sense of connection. In order for us to do that, we've got to give up ourselves. We've got to disconnect because it's coming from that place of freeze and shutdown. This could be pleasing and appeasing. It could be fitting in, um, it, which is like part of masking actually can be either or. Because masking, as you know, can be trying to fit in and make out that we're okay when we're not. But it can actually be pleasing and appeasing as well. A fawn response is making a threatening situation less threatening. It doesn't mean that it's safe. What it means is that our nervous system is looking for a way that it can utilise social engagement so that we're safer in the moment. Just as this is a hierarchy of responses we can go through in a specified order that we have no control over, we also have to come back through them in order to regain and restore safety. There has to be a a foundation of safety to be able to do that first. Say our child has been in school and they've, um, they've been masking. And again, like, people think children choose this. They think adults choose. They don't choose. Yeah, this is it's, instinctive, automatic, unconscious decision by their nervous system to be able to adapt to and manage that threat. That they're makes currently so doing. much sense when you explain it that way as well. You know, we see masking, and it's such a big issue for so many parents because if you're trying to, you know, address, I, I believe my child is autistic, I want to get support for them and I want to do the best thing. But they're masking at school. It presents so many more issues. But what you're really showing there is it's, again, it's this, the polyvagal system working with this danger sense and it's a way of surviving the danger it's not just uh, like you say it could be a piece and all that so, but it is this yeah. fawn response well, why would a child need to fawn in school there are four places that our nervous system takes cues from the environment around us the people around us the interactions those people are having with us and within our own body a child may need to, to may utilize a fawn response because The school environment doesn't feel safe enough for them as an individual, a unique individual. It could be because some one or more people in that environment don't feel safe enough to them. It could be ways those people are interacting with them don't feel safe enough. So that person actually could feel safe enough, but because they're not attuned to that child's needs or experiences in the moment, that will bring... A, mis- a layer of misattunement and a level of safe and safety for the child. Or it could be because that child is feeling unsafe within themselves. Yeah. And you look at our times right now. This perfect example, okay? Our kids are going back to school after being in lockdown again and, and schools have been physically closed for yeah. a lot of children, right? They're going back to a different environment. It looks different. They've missed friends. They've 
there'll be worries about, well, has this happened? Has that happened? Will this happen? Won't this happen? And when you've already got children that feel, have an, a foundation of unsafety, so they naturally feel unsafe and, and anxious, which is autism, PDA and early trauma to the T, then what happens is just going into that environment, which could be the same as usual, same people around them as usual, but that's making them feel unsafe yeah. because of what they're experiencing or maybe because of something they've experienced in the past and now this situation is bringing that back up, bubbling that back up to the surface or, as is so often the case, could be a combination of all four. I think that's what often gets me. So we try and... It's, there's a great value in analogies and, and basic examples but there's a danger also sometimes that we can oversimplify things and we just put them into these pockets yeah. and it's why what you, this goes right back to what we're talking about with labor uh, once you put it in a box it's in the box exactly there's so and much more to it it's something i've been learning very slowly <laughs> myself but it is my response to a situation and it is thinking about well, what's my facial expression and something i'm going to finish on this because i think it, it, it works with there's uh, a nice book into this nice I was once talking, uh, it was actually the same talk as Chad was talking about the unmet need. But his point was that we can often display something we don't realise we're doing. And he said that often what we call our resting face is actually communicating stress back to our kids. Yeah. And what looks like, uh, what we think, I'm being calm, I'm like a Hindu cow here right now. But for them, it's interpreted very differently because the resting face shows and that's yeah. not so far away no. from, you know, it, it, it's subtle, but that it gets interpreted that way. This um, is a really important point, Duncan. I'm so glad you brought it up. If we go back to what we were saying about autism and about finding it more difficult to read safety cues and about if you add in trauma or then if, it, if, it, if, if it's an individual who isn't autistic and has experienced trauma, then what is safe for one person? Can be dangerous or threatening for another because all experiences are individual as is as our needs like how i how something impacts you will be different to how it impacts me if when the two of us were in a car obviously pre-covid if the two of us, <laughs> if the two of us were sat in a car With glass divided down the yeah, middle yeah yeah bit of perfect <laughs> there and there was a bit of a minor bump both of us could have a very different response to that, both in the moment, but ongoing as well. Like I could walk away and be absolutely fine. You could be suffering from chronic problems for years afterwards from one tiny bump. And it's because it's not that bump. It will be how your nervous system has already been wired to respond to stress in the first place, how it was wired to in the first few years of your life. Yeah. So a flat face is a perfect one because when you feel at ease, a flat face doesn't feel threatening. A flat face falls into the context of social engagement. But if you don't, if someone doesn't feel safe enough in their body, a flat face can be determined, can be interpreted as dangerous, or it could be interpreted as threatening. Because if you were in a situation that was traumatic, say, and that person had a flat face, you're going to have an imprint now within you that flat face means threat. Yeah. So. This is why it's so important that we don't make assumptions about what anyone is experiencing, even if we know that person well and we know how they normally respond and react to things. Because how, we, how any individual responds to something in the moment, a big part of it is going to be determined by stuff that their, their past experiences and what we know about them, but also it can be driven by other stuff as well. So if you've got a child or other person who, anybody else, who you're sending out cues of safety to them, that could be interpreted as dangerous or threatening to them. But then when they come home and the environment is safer, it's not that they feel safe, it's that the environment is safer, then what yeah. happens is they start moving back through and out of these stress responses. So yeah. what happens is we get that more sympathetic-based behaviour. It's their nervous system trying to repair. Their nervous system is trying to resolve it. But if we're in a sympathetic place ourselves, which 
often we don't realize because it doesn't have to be like it can be mild anxiety it can just be tiny little stuff that we don't notice we don't see that we see our, our child as attacking us we see it as something else and if you're in a freeze in more of a shutdown place then you're going to have a totally different perspective again it's going to be you're going to be coming from a helpless place a powerless place uh like why do they keep doing this to me this isn't fair like lots of different things this then ties back to you saying about the calm face because you can look very calm on the outside and not be in social engagement you can have a, you can feel very calm in your body and not be in social engagement be in a in a stuck in a chronic freeze response or really place a shutdown and what happens is it's almost like a duck gliding across water or a swan, if you like. A swan's probably a better analogy, where it's very graceful, it's very calm and thing. What you don't see is the legs going hell for leather into the surface. <laughs> and that's what's happening in a freeze response because a freeze response contains the sympathetic energy, yeah. which is why then to come back out of it, we have to move back through that sympathetic energy. It comes down to what I call the 5S effect. Um, which is my unique methodology and how we're wired to connect, but also how children are wired to develop as well. Um, and it's everything starts with safety because it's safety that brings the possibilities for connection, for change, for healing, for growth, for development, for learning. Without safety, there is only survival. So the first thing is safety. Then after safety, it's attunement. Without safety, attunement is a lot harder within our own body. Then from a place of attunement comes a place of connection. From that place of connection, then it's more easy and we're more able to offer our children autonomy and our children are able to be and truly express themselves in the ways they need to, which is another one of their core needs. And then from that place, they're able to trust in us. They're able to trust in our relationship. And as a result, they learn how to trust in themselves because those five things, they develop within themselves as a result of what we've modeled to them. So as a result of that relationship, they learn how to feel safe in their body. They learn how to attune to their own physiology. They learn how to connect with their bodies and what they need in any moment. They're able to be who they truly are, even if the people in the environments around them are not supportive of who they are. And they're able to trust in themselves to be able to utilize these survival responses whenever they need to, not because there's a tiger coming through, but because they can ad advocate for themselves. They can voice what isn't okay for them and whatever. And the more safety you have, then the more you're able to do that because you're able to put a break onto that, that stress response system. That's at the heart of everything I teach. It's uh, everything starts with safety. In a couple of weeks, I'm doing a masterclass that's talking all about this, which is about the missing links for everything, which is I why it's a beautiful ending. I'm going to be putting in the links in the description, all the stuff for uh, Shan's, for her uh, the business and the, the work that she's doing with polyvagal theory, uh, anything to do with that, but also for this amazing masterclass that she's got. So I've learned so much in the last hour. It's unreal. And I'm going to have to invite you back on, Sean, another time to, to go into this in more detail. Thank you so much for your time. I want everyone here to please okay. hit like, hit subscribe, ring the bell so you know when there's new content. I want to thank Sean so much. Oh, you're, you're welcome. And thank you so much, Duncan, for number one, for inviting me but to talk with you today. But number two, for sharing time and space with me. It's been an honour and it's been a privilege. Uh, likewise, likewise. Stay safe, everybody. And we will see you again on the next episode.